At first glance, when you take a brief look at this chapter of My Hero Academia, it's very simplistic. It's about, you know, our characters winding down and just getting to see them in a very uplifting setting compared to what we've kind of had going on for over a year now in the My Hero Academia manga, ever since, you know, the war arc began, and then the aftermath of that with Izuku by himself. So, this chapter is a nice change of pace, and I feel like many that sat down to read this chapter read through it very quickly, and they're like, that's a good chapter, and that was about it. However, there is so much more going on within this chapter that it's actually kind of ridiculous. There's so many hidden little details that Horikoshi Sensei kind of wrote into certain individual panels throughout the chapter, and I was just like, whoa, I had to do a double take and reread the chapter multiple times just to get kind of everything that he snuck in, and even then, there's probably many details that I still missed myself, even though I reread the chapter multiple times. So let's uh, talk about these hidden details, some of the things that Horikoshi Sensei kind of threw in there that people obviously would miss on their first read. And one of the details I think that some might get, but some might have missed, is the Bakugo panel. If you look very closely with the whole situation with Izuku needing a bath and all that, it's very funny, it's a nice comedic scene, and it's also man service. you get to actually see kind of a glimpse at the scars on Bakugo after the aftermath of the war arc. Because as you remember, Bakugo did jump in front of Izuku and he took a hit from Shigaraki. We know he took a huge blow and people thought, myself included, maybe Bakugo would die in that moment in the story of the manga. But obviously, you know, Bakugo is still around and he's alive, but the effects of that fight are still lingering on his body. You see scars on his body, which I think is a nice attention to detail from Horikoshi Sensei because, let's be honest, here. When it comes to most shonen manga, you'll have a character getting cuts, bruises, their arms broken, whatever, and then, you know, let's say a couple chapters down the road after they recover, you know, they no longer have scars, they no longer have bruises or anything. There's nothing to really show the lingering effects of the previous battles. And I like how Horikoshi Sensei does that. This is something that he's always done with his characters, like we've seen it through Izuku and how Izuku's arms have been messed up and we saw the visible scars on his body since the very beginning of the manga. But seeing it all also being applied to other characters is something that I truly appreciate. It's the small details that really make a series just so much better, in my personal opinion. But that's not obviously where just the small details in. There's so much more going on within the chapter. Another small detail that sticks out is something towards the end of the chapter, where you get to see Tokoyami have a burn mark on the bottom of his leg. Now, this is something very subtle, and this is something I only noticed after, like, my third reread of, you know, the manga of My Hero Academia, you know, this week's chapter. If you look very closely down in this panel on Tokoyami's leg, you will actually see the burn mark on him, which we do know that he did you know, actually get burns in the war arc thanks to Dobby and him trying to save Hawks. So I do appreciate that as well. It shows that, you know, it's not just, let's say, Bakugo that has lingering effects. You get to see Tokoyami that has effects on his body. That That's a nice little crucial detail that was also thrown in, and that's another attention to detail that I did not expect, especially for such a small panel. That is really important to show that Horikoshi has not forgotten about these little moments with these characters that really have defined them to this very point, but obviously there's other things besides, let's say, scars and bruises. We have Ochiko and her sleeping. Now, when you look at this panel, it's very cute. She's knocked out. She's drooling on herself. It's like, okay, that's cute. It's a cute Ochiko panel, but if you look very closely, you will see Ochiko with mittens on her hands, and I know many probably look at this and be like, why is she wearing mittens on her hand when she's sleeping? But when you really think about it, it all kind of comes together. Her quirk. As we know, her quirk float. Whatever she puts her hands on, it will start to float. Lose gravity, will start floating up. And you gotta imagine, when she's sleeping, her quirk doesn't just deactivate. She can still make things probably float completely while she's asleep. So imagine if she was sleeping and she puts her hands on her bed, her bed would just float up to the ceiling. Like, she'll wake up with being pressed up against the ceiling. So, yeah, that's the point here, is that the mittens are probably used as a way for her to actually not cause objects around her to float, like a blanket, a pillow, her bed, etc., herself. So, that's nice. That's also another nice little attention to detail to kind of show how, once again, quirks are an extension of a person, and that they also could cause where your, let's say, sleep cycle is very different. It's something that's kind of been alongside of Shigaraki since the very beginning, and what I talked about a very 
very long time ago. If you remember, I talked about how Shigaraki, how his cork works, destruction, before he had his power and his upgrades right now, basically where he's at, you know, I talked about with how his cork was, if he put five fingers on something, it would instantly start to disintegrate. And you gotta imagine if he was, let's say, sleeping, he could easily touch something and it would just disintegrate. Imagine sleeping in your bed and then all of a sudden you fall to the ground because you disintegrated your bed. You know, that's kind of why he always had gloves on or why he had, you know, certain objects he grabbed was only with a few fingers. It's the little details like that. And once again, we get to see this through Ochiko in this chapter. So just nice stuff. I, I really like these little things going on throughout the chapter. And then you also have nice little nods to, let's say, Shoto Toroki and how he is changing as well, which that's the next part I want to get into. So obviously there is going to be a lot of discussion about Izuku within this chapter and thanks to him being able to wind down but I feel like there is a huge focus on Shoto within this chapter getting to show the level of maturity that he has and how much he has grown as a character because if there's one thing that we can all admit is that after the war arc Dobby Endeavor and Shoto's entire arc has kind of been shoved to the side a little bit. It has, but for good reason. I mean, we needed to focus on Izuku because it's been a long time since he really had a major spotlight, and it has been technically like a Todoroki main show for a very long time. So it makes sense that they were kind of shoved to the side a little bit to focus on Izuku because he technically is the MC. But uh, it seems like Horikoshi Sensei is acknowledging the fact that, you know, he has not forgotten about that plot line, and Shoto has been dealing with his own problems on the side along side of Izuku and the other characters because he's like, you know, he's been getting a lot of flack ever since, you know, the whole reveal, the public reveal of Dobby being Endeavor's son, and you gotta imagine the weight of that. For instance, it's not just Endeavor getting constantly, you know, picked on or yelled at and, you know, kind of just put down throughout the entirety of the media. You have also Shoto that's probably experiencing the exact same thing, and just like how Izuku was kind of, you know, not allowed inside at first, how people were really against him coming inside side to be in that shelter, you know, probably Shoto is in a very similar way, because he is technically the son of Endeavor, the brother of Dobby, and they know now know the connection that Dobby has with the Todoroki family, so everybody looking at Shoto is going to be like, you're a liability, because Dobby could come to the shelter and try to get rid of you and Endeavor, so, you know, it's not just Izuku that was experiencing that issue, it was also Shoto, and Shoto's had a lot of similarities to Izuku for a very long time, to his overall upbringing to his origin story you know there, there's a lot of things like you know with the power that he has I, I really like how there is a nice parallel between the two characters there obviously is some differences but I do like that we get to see Shoto going through something very similar to Izuku but he's handling it in a very different way but uh, I love the maturity I really love the maturity from Shoto and he's definitely becoming one of my personal favorite characters like he's always been one of my favorites but I really have been loving the direction of his character character in the latest chapters and latest arcs of My Hero Academia. But uh, let's now talk about the next one. Let's talk about Baku since we're getting into the personalities changing, etc. I do like how Bakugo tries to call Izuku Izuku. Instead of always calling him like Deku, which as we all know started off as an insult, he now calls Izuku Izuku, and I find that very funny. It's unnerving, but it's very funny because it makes sense. Like the first character really to call Izuku Izuku is Bakugo is just nice, and I, I, I love that entire time. It shows that Bakugo is maturing, he really is trying to change, and that he is making a solid effort. It's not something that's just going to happen in a, a single chapter, but he is trying to change. So it's a good moment as well to show that growth for Bakugo's character after him finally apologizing to everything that he's done in the past to Izuku. But uh, moving forward, we also have the funny stuff of the chapter, which I guess now let's talk about that lighthearted you know, content. The bath scene. I really love how the chapter opens up to just Izuku being rushed into the bath and thrown into the water to literally get clean. You gotta imagine, he must have smelt so awful for them to really rush him into the bath that quickly. Like, seriously, they they hauled him into that bath. They threw him in and gave him a full-on washing machine scrub down. And I'm just like, I cannot imagine. Like, he probably smelled so awful. He was out there for so many days and nights for over a month, apparently. I can't imagine. He probably did not bath probably maybe once at all out there of, you know, you know, the whole war arc and all that. After the war arc, he probably just went off to do his own thing. So, I just, the, the stench was probably unimaginable, and just seeing them rush into the bath with him 
just basically says, yeah, it was bad. So I got a good laugh from that. It was a good chuckle, but it was a nice lighthearted moment just to see the goofy art style that Horikoshi threw in with the characters, you know, with Isuku actually needing a bath. But besides that, we also have set up for the next arc that we're going to be getting into, and that is Jiro wanting to kind of set up like a cultural festival 2.0. Now, I personally don't think we're going to have the exact same thing as the original cultural festival. I feel like there's probably going to be twists and turns, and it's going to be some definite differences, but I do like seeing this unity that, you know, UA Class A has kind of formed, because this is something that's been a big detail for a while now, is that ever since Jiro and all of them kind of did the cultural festival and the musical, and they kind of sang in front of everyone in the school, you know, they've been more bonded as a class, and seeing how Jiro is the one to initiate it, being actually openly initiating it first, shows growth within her character, but also the bond with the whole class and how they're willing to work together for better, and if Shoto's willing to really hop in and actually work with them, I feel like the entire class will definitely rally behind Shoto and want to help out even more. So I just feel like there is going to definitely be some twists and turns, even if it seems wholesome right now. I feel like maybe All for One or someone's going to pop up and cause something to really go downhill because, you know, there's just no way that everything's going to go peacefully and good with what's been going on in the manga for a very long time. Which, speaking of All for One, we got to talk about the Stain letter. So, Stain's letter, I tried to read it, and from what I could briefly read, it really was a glorified love letter to All Might. There really isn't much information on that brief little image that you can see with the letter. All it really is is just you know, Stain saying, hey, All Might's the only one that can kill me, he's the glorious, the unmovable object, that pillar of society, that's basically all Stain really says within the love letter, so there isn't anything hidden in terms of what information that he actually wanted to say. But that's pretty much about it when it comes to this week's chapter of My Hero Academia. It's a good chapter. Cannot wait for next week's chapter. But uh, I'll leave it at that. You all have a wonderful day or not wherever you live. If you enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And with that, guys, be safe, stay healthy, chibi out.